good afternoon as it now is. Uh, we're very, very grateful to John Manzoni, uh, Chief Executive of the Civil Service, for coming here at very short notice um, because, um, as, as we said, Mark Sedwell is still held up. And um, with that, we can kick off. Gavin Freegard, our program director, who's been with his team putting together Whitehall Monitor for this year, is going to take us through uh, the presentation. It's a long report, as many of you know. It has many, many parts. We encourage you to delve into this and to come, uh, come at us with all kinds of questions. But Gavin will take us through some of the main themes of that. Gavin, thanks very much indeed. Thank you, Bronwyn, and um, I'm delighted to see so many of you here for today's Whitehall Monitor launch. Thank you very much indeed for coming. This is our sixth annual snapshot of the size, shape and performance of central government. Uh, there are 111 charts across nine chapters, lovingly put together by the fantastic Whitehall Monitor team. Don't worry, I'm not about to run through all 111 charts in the next 10 minutes. That would be five and a half seconds per chart. Um, but I'll let you take a look uh, on the website and delve into much more detail. What I will do is just give you a very general overview of some of the key themes of this year's report. With two months to go until we are due to exit the European Union, political divisions have impeded preparations for Brexit. The civil service has been responding to that um, by expanding, and those expansions are changing the shape of the civil service. But also there's a lot of other day-to-day -day business of government that still matters, and we mustn't let um, everything else distract us from it. So let's start with Brexit. Brexit has been described by a number of senior public servants as the most challenging peacetime task the civil service has ever faced. And one of the reasons that it's so challenging is the tight timetable in which it's likely to happen. Now, behind me, you can see the time taken over various significant projects. You can see that we had nearly 12 years for automatic enrolment into pensions and preparations for the 2012 London Olympics. The Brexit transition period, assuming that we leave with a deal, is much shorter than that. Um, even with a possible extension, there's an awful lot to get done in that time, changing the shape of government and adapting to a new role in the world. So this was going to be a large challenge anyway, given those tight timelines. But the political situation has made it even more challenging. A minority government finds it much more difficult to get legislation through Parliament. Only five of the expected bills needed for Brexit have so far made it through to royal assent, so we could be in for quite a legislative rush over the next few weeks and months. But one of the biggest political complications has been what's happened with ministerial turnover. Ministerial turnover can cause severe disruption to departments. Departments have to adapt to new styles and priorities. Ministers have to grasp challenging new briefs quickly. Now, what you can see behind me is a chart of a particular type of ministerial turnover. These are resignations that happened outside of reshuffles. And you can see under Thatcher, Major, Blair, Brown and Cameron. Those big dots are cabinet ministers. Those smaller dots are junior ministers. So that what's happened, that's what happened between Thatcher and Cameron. Let's have a look at what's happened under May. You can see quite an unprecedented number, 21 resignations outside of reshuffles between the 2017 general election and the end of 2018. It's not just the number that's unprecedented, though. It's also the number that have been due to policy or political disagreement. I'm going to highlight in pink. Those are all of the policy or political resignations between Thatcher and Cameron. And again, if we look at May, there's a lot of pink on that particular chart. Of the 21 resignations, 14 were due to policy disagreements and 12 of those were down to Brexit. Now, between all of those resignations and reshuffles, it means that half of all ministers came into their current post in 2018. Again, that's not just had an effect on Brexit, it's had uh, an effect on particular other policy areas, uh, such as justice. And digital culture, media and sport as well has seen sort of high turnover of secretaries of state and junior ministers. So the civil service has been faced with the challenge of ministerial turnover on top of the tight deadlines to get everything done. But it's responded to that impressively. First, it's expanded to deal with the challenge. So these are staff numbers um, going back to 2010. And you can see that in 2010, there were around 470,000 civil servants. Now, the civil service expected that would fall to around 380,000 by 2015. And though it didn't quite get that low, the 384,000 civil servants that were in post at the time of the EU referendum was a post-Second World War low. 
Ever since then, we've seen an increase in every quarter. There are 20,000 more civil servants now than there were at the time of the referendum. One in five of the job cuts between 2010 and 2016 have been reversed. Now, the experience has been different for different departments. On the chart behind me, you're about to see various bubbles appear for different departments. The higher the bubble, the greater the percentage increase, and the bigger the bubble, the more staff that actually represents in real terms. So this is going to show you staff numbers change since the referendum. Some departments have actually seen a slight fall. Uh, so the Department of Health and Social Care, you can see on the far right there, um, that went through quite a big redundancy round earlier in this period. But it means that most departments have seen quite big rises. We've also got DEXU up there at the top. Um, obviously that didn't exist before, so we can't give you a percentage change, but we can give you a sense of just how big it is. Now, a lot of those departments that have experienced rises are quite Brexit affected. The Department for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy, BAES, is estimated by the National Audit Office to have more Brexit work streams than other departments. The Department for Digital, Culture, Media and Sport, the biggest percentage riser, is fourth on that list. We've also got the Department of International Trade and the Department for Environment, Food and Rural Affairs up there. Now, Brexit is not the only driver of those staff number increases. Ministry of Justice, that owes a lot to prison officers. And over at DfE, the Department for Education, that's to do with the changing role that the department has uh, in direct relationship with its academies and also adjusting to new responsibilities like higher and further education policy. As those new civil servants have come in, those new, new hires have taken up posts, it's actually started to change the shape of the civil service in a number of ways. And I'll just run through a couple of those quickly. The first is looking at what's happened to the grade structure of the, senior, of the civil service. So this chart is going to show us the different grades and the percentage change in the number of people in those grades since 2010. And if we start with the senior civil service, we can see that after cuts to about 2013, it started to tick back up again, but it's become more pronounced since Brexit, and the senior civil service is now bigger than it was in 2020. And that senior civil service and equivalent for our cabinet office friends in the room, I know the ONS counts it slightly differently, so important methodological point to get in there. Um, we see a similar pattern when it comes to grade six and seven, the next band down. And in fact, the only part of the civil service uh, in terms of grades where cuts continue is at the lowest level, administrative officers and assistants. That means that the shape of the civil service has changed significantly. We've gone from nearly half of all civil servants being AO and AA in 2010 to more like a third in 2018. Those new hires are also changing the diversity balance of the civil service, and this is just one example of that, and this is the gender balance, a key priority for the late Lord Haywood um, as his, in his tenure as Cabinet Secretary. We've seen lots of diversity uh, measures coming in, the diversity and inclusion strategy, and although you can still see that men outnumber women more with every step up in seniority, we can see that those numbers of women as a percentage of even the senior civil service have risen to a historic high. The story isn't quite so positive on some other measures of diversity. There's still quite a long way to go on ethnic minority diversity and disability diversity, for instance. But even there, we're seeing improvement. And it means that the new cohort of civil servants who've started coming in since Brexit, Generation Brex, if you like, are younger, sorry, younger, more likely to be based in London, more senior in grade, as you've seen, and slightly more diverse uh, than before. Also, some other sort of successes it's worth just noting uh, when it comes to the civil service workforce. Engagement levels, morale, remain incredibly high and are improving in many places. Also, we're seeing some progress on building professional skills across the civil service as well. But challenges remain. <clears throat> Last week, we published a big report looking at civil service staff turnover, and we can see that in some departments, including the Cabinet Office, the Ministry of Housing, Communities and Local Government, and the Treasury, one in four and even one in five um, civil servants moved uh, out of the departments, so that's out of the civil service altogether or to a different department uh, between 2016 and 2017. Those numbers are higher at senior level in some cases, in fact in all cases. Uh, they're also higher in London, they tend to be higher in policy teams and again that can cause a huge amount of disruption as knowledge and expertise is lost and we estimate that it could cost up to around £74 million. Now there have been lots of headlines in recent days and weeks about civil servants having to move to prepare for no-deal Brexit. Again, turnover presents challenges, but the ability of the civil service to make those decisions flexibly and move people around quickly speaks to its adaptability at a time of great challenge. Now, of course, it doesn't 
isn't just about Brexit. There is the other day-to-day -day business of government that still matters. Brexit has inevitably distracted from a lot of that. My colleague, Dr. Emily Andrews, is keeping a list of various things that have been delayed by Brexit. Everything from the adult social care green paper to the internet safety white paper to the Open Government Partnership National Action Plan. So there's quite a lot uh, that has been held up as we focus on Brexit. There are other big things across government which also continue to run and continue to pose challenges, such as public services and, of course, major projects. Now, um, these major projects do not include Brexit-related projects. These are ones that are in the portfolio of government projects, currently more than 130, which are overseen by the Infrastructure and Projects Authority, which every year gives a RAG rating on whether they're confident that these projects will be delivered on time and on budget. Red is obviously bad, and green is that they are likely to be delivered on time and on budget. And if you look at 2013, you can see that nearly half of projects were green or amber green. That is highly likely or probable to be delivered on time or on budget. In 2018, that fell to more like a fifth, and the percentage of projects that were red or amber red has also doubled in that time. Now, there are a number of reasons um, for this. The IPA has been admirably honest in saying that it um, would like to see fewer red and amber red projects. It's doing a lot to develop project capability across the civil service, and that in itself might mean that more honest ratings are coming to bear on these projects. But again, these are huge projects, everything from universal credit to high speed two to big military capability projects, and these are going to continue to challenge government. New projects entering the portfolio are, portfolio are also more likely to be complex by their very nature. There are other big things that government is doing, uh, not least digital government. Um, this chart is showing you 789 digital services which now exist across government. Four departments and their public bodies account for more than half of those. The Department for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy, the Department for Environment, Food and Rural Affairs, the Department of Health and Social Care, and the Department for Transport. And all of those um, include everything from registering for a new passport or driving li license to being able to sign up for flood alerts to tell you when you might need to vacate your property. That 789 is up from around 25 exemplar projects um, that the early uh, government digital service conducted. Um, so that's quite a large increase. Now, again, challenges remain around digital government. The Science and Technology Select Committee is currently inquiring into uh, digital government and the role of the government digital service. And some of the more ambitious uh, reforms undertaken. Government as a platform, so the idea that you build certain things once that can be used across various different services, has a much more mixed picture. The Verify uh, sort of identity checking service um, is a case in point, and we go into much more detail on that in our report. So, in conclusion, uh, political divisions have made preparing for Brexit more difficult. The civil service has been adapting to Brexit largely through um, em employing more people, uh, which has led to a change in the composition of the civil service. And inevitably, there have been distractions from the day-to-day -day business of government, but there are still considerable challenges, and those are considerably important things that we should not forget. Now, as I said, um, that is a very, very quick overview of everything in the report. <laughs> That is, a very, that is another very short overview of everything in the report. Those are all 111 charts. Um, again, I'm not going to zoom in on all of them, um, but if you do go to our website, uh, you will be able to look at those 111 charts and the nine chapters which give you much more detail on ministers, the civil service, finances, public spending, legislation, major projects, digital, communications and transparency, and performance. So everything from permanent secretary career paths to which departments are surprisingly big on LinkedIn. So I'll, I'll commend the rest of the report to you. Enjoy reading. Thank you very much. Gavin, thank you very much indeed, including for that last slide off of an IFG wallpaper, I think, made of it. Um, thanks very much. I'm going to fire some questions at you later. But um, Don Manzoni, I, thank you again very much for joining us in this annual event to launch what the Whitehall Monitor team is, has been doing. How do, you, how do you set the priorities for the civil service, um, given everything that we know is going on and what Gavin has just described about this later work? Uh, I think, it, I mean, it, um, first point I'd say is it becomes increasingly important to set the priorities mm. of the civil service because I've said consistently that we've been trying to do too much. Mm. Uh, and we're certainly trying to do too much if we try and add on 
Brexit. So, so I would, I mean, if I just think through what's important right now, uh, uh, right in front of us is, of course, delivering a good Brexit. Uh, take your pick as to what that looks like, but delivering a good one, um, uh, it, I think it remains very, very important. And of course, the civil service has been preparing uh, for the worst. We might be hoping for the best, but we've been preparing a number of scenarios. So number one, I think, uh, good Brexit. Um, uh, number two, and many of the things in the report uh, this year emphasize, I think, many of the changes that we have been attempting to implement. Uh, the, the implementation of you know, more collaborative work across the civil service, cross-cutting structures, the functions, professional, professionalisation in a number of dimensions, all of those things uh, uh, come absolutely to the fore in the current context because Brexit is one of those events that, um, uh, that is a complex policy problem and uh, a delivery problem to a set time frame. So we have to bring all of that together. So. So the next thing for me, as I think about priorities, is, is um, how do I use, how do we use in the civil service this moment to accelerate those changes as opposed to displace those changes? Because, quite frankly, uh, those changes are absolutely required to, to implement a successful Brexit. Um, and then, as indeed uh, uh, Gavin mentioned, there are, of course, the, the other priorities of government's agenda. Uh, which are necessarily being displaced pro tem, but um, uh, uh, one, one of the interest, you know, one of the accelerations is to is to engage the system now in in actually the, the first conversation since I've been in government, uh, genuinely about actually what is not going to get done. So the beginning of a process of prioritisation, a sensible prioritisation, you can't you, you, not not get done, but move to the right. Uh, I, I think you know that. Um, uh, how, how do we balance what is pressing and urgent uh, and then make some space for the other things that are happening? I mean, we have got the long-term plan going on, we have got the MOD, uh, we have got prisons, and we, you know, we have to continue delivering all of the services, so all of those things have to, to do. And then in the middle of all of that, uh, let's remember the staff. The civil service is a remarkably hard-working hard -working place. Um, uh, you know, it isn't... Uh, uh, it, and, and it is being put through an extraordinary, an extraordinary uh, set of tasks right now. And therefore, I think uh, the well-being of our 400,000 odd people uh, really matters. And, and the closer you get to the centre, perhaps the more complex and difficult that becomes. But it is an issue that we have to take care of at this particular moment. So, if, if, you know, th those are, if you like, three or four things that I think become important for us. Thanks very much for that. You said some time ago, a couple of years ago, I think that the civil service is doing 30% too much. M much quoted remark, I'm not clear how formally you meant it at the time, but do you still feel it's doing too much or being asked to do too much by a big, a big um, it, Only the first bit of the sentence was quoted. I said it was doing 30% too much to do it all well. Um, uh, and I still feel that it does too much to do it well mm. because the because you're the, mm. it's just too thinly spread. Mm. Uh, so and and hence my my mm. focus on prioritisation and mm. you know and the truth is and you know these projects that uh, that was on that chart you know these I mean these are complicated things mm. uh, they're all complicated things um, uh, and you know if you look at infrastructure we're actually as good in this country at building infrastructure as any other country uh, where it gets really hard is where we're increasingly having to operate upon ourselves. Many of those major projects are transformations of how the civil service works, transformations of how services are delivered to citizens. Those transformations involve many more human beings, how you change people's work, how you rewire and replumb systems, and those always take longer than you think. And that is actually why, um, as the characteristics of the major project portfolio changes, and we get more uh, IT projects, more transformation projects, it gets harder. Mm. And that is, um, uh, y y y you know, an, uh, an increasingly um, uh, important thing. And, they, and that is why it, that just takes up leadership bandwidth. Uh, I mean, I don't, this isn't something that's amenable to an analysis. You don't send a commission out and ask people, you know, are you doing too much? Because you can see it, the, the bandwidth is absorbed, mm. the leadership attention is absorbed and, and everything that we do in government has to have the proper attention. So that is why I, and I continue to believe that we must continue to prioritise.
Thanks for that. Gavin, one of the slides you didn't put up there, but it was in the uh, kaleidoscope at the end, is about civil service engagement, and um, which is uh, uh, always a feature of Whitehall Monitor. And, and um, your argument is that actually this shows that civil servants are remarkably cheerful. Uh, indeed, if I'm across. not summarising too much. <laughs> Um, indeed, across most um, themes as well as the civil service people survey, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with, um, asks about everything from pay and benefits to leadership and managing change, uh, and how that's being done in people's departments as well as sort of overall morale. And it's something that we've seen over the last few years for all of the sort of political maelstrom that the civil service has been operating in. These scores have been going up. Why is that? Well, it seems that this is genuinely a management and leadership tool which people are using. So departments we know sort of pour over the results they get, they sort of cut them in different ways to try to understand why things are the way they are and they work on improving them. I think this year as well there may also be that sort of generation breaks effect coming in which is you've got a new cohort of civil servants who might be new to the challenges, might be relishing those challenges, um, maybe perhaps on sort of slightly more interesting jobs than some of their peers. Now, inevitably, some of that's speculative, but that might be another thing that is driving some of those increases. John, one of the things Gavin did put up there was the question of staff turnover in the civil service. And this is, as you know, something we put out a report last week with, uh, by Tom Sass and Emma Norris on of just how high the movement, uh, not people so much leaving the civil service, but moving between departments. and. We have only <coughs> partial figures for how much they then move between projects as well. But I mean, the, the, the one that leapt out was a quarter of, of people in the Treasury moving department every year. What's, mm. what's your response to this? And what do you think the, the, um, the, the answers might be? The actual turnover uh, of staff leaving the civil service is, uh, is about half that mm. of, uh, uh, of the private sector, actually. So the leaving isn't an mm. issue. Mm. But I think you've highlighted something. I've felt very strongly about this for a long time. I, I, I am fundamentally, uh, as you know, of the view that um, uh, we need to change the career structures and career paths for young civil servants. There is no question of that in my mind. I believe in building deep experience uh, as opposed to a uh, sort of highly intelligent generalist career um, uh, and and um, uh, therefore uh, but that needs quite a lot of rewiring and replumbing of the structures underneath um, uh, in order that a young civil servant can come and build uh, a career path which is built on adjacencies and and increasing depth by the way our remuneration structures don't help because we because we, we don't allow people to progress in grade, so therefore they're bound to hop around. As a young person, you, you want more money, you're going to go and go over there, and then you're going to go over there and go over there. So yeah, that's been an extraordinarily difficult bit to change mm. in the current os, os sort of... And a team manager doesn't have the right to say, don't go in for that. Open well, it's a sort of mixed economy in that here. sense. They, they sort of do, and it's yeah. not universally the case that they don't, but yeah. we're not clear enough. Yeah. Uh, for instance, that, a, that, that I don't think we're clear enough all through our system that a, that a team leader is accountable for the development of his, of his or her staff. And I believe that very strongly that's what should happen and we'll change it to, to make it that. We have changed quite a lot of this. We have created um, uh, career ladders and career paths in all of the professions now. We have accreditation levels so that people can actually come in from uh, either from the outside or as a young uh, you know, graduate and they can see a career path which will allow them to progress while staying in broadly the same discipline. And I believe that over time, this isn't going to happen overnight, but the next generation of senior civil, civil service leaders, I believe, will have had a different career path to the ones that we see today. And that is, that is quite deliberate. And, and, and um, it doesn't stop people sort of being generalist leaders, mm. but it means that they have a, what I call a depth of career anchor. They, they may have been a specialist for much longer before they... <clears throat> yes, or they've done, uh, or, or they have come back to a career anchor mm. and, and progressed in that way. And the truth is, that is how the world works. That is what the outside world looks like. It is not what the civil service looks like. And, and you know, if you imagine as a senior civil servant having had a career like that, why, why, wouldn't, why wouldn't we be uh, the place? Where, you know, we do more of everything than any company in this country. I keep saying this. We do more of everything in the civil service every day than any company in this country. And therefore, we can provide much deeper experience than any company in this country. And we can therefore build the most talented leaders 
than any company in this country. And so why wouldn't we be the place? And we should be absolutely fine for people to go out for a bit, because I know they'll come back, because it's more interesting and they get more responsibility in the civil service. So it's a sort of, it's quite a different philosophy. I think, uh, you know, I'm not... I'm not uh, about the progressing within the grade, the, the, you know, well, the, we the, have the, to, the kernel of the problem, you know, do you have to change the rules? And, it's and, an aspect of the problem, it's not the only problem, but I think yet we are changing the rules. Yeah. We are changing, um, uh, but, but it's very, it's very difficult while we can't find the space in the, in the budgets to allow that to happen because you've got to have both promotion and, and, and the natural progression and you've also got to allow people to stay in grade. Increasingly we're encouraging people to stay in their grade and get better at their job uh, and, then, and we are rewarding them for that but we're not doing enough of it yet, mm. truthfully. How do you put a spending review which is supposed to be beginning very soon? Um, into this kind of picture? Um, I, you know, I'm a businessman, right? Look at everything as an opportunity. Uh, uh, the spending review will, I mean, it will happen sometime this year. It's not obvious exactly when. Uh, it's not, um, so, so, uh, so this is the talk, not your talk, uh, but the widespread talk of, uh, of one starting this spring feels it, uh, a bit premature. I think it all depends. <laughs> Uh, and, and, uh, and, and the Treasury, you know, will, I mean, they'll obviously try and take the right decisions at the right time, but I mean, you know, to, to kick it off now, for instance, would not be very wise, so that won't happen. Um, but I think it has to be done this year, and the question of whether it's a slightly longer term um, outlook, which I, which I hope in many ways it will be, because it allows the civil service to lengthen its stride and to think ahead. But of course, if the political realities are such that that isn't sensible, then it won't happen that way. It'll be a, it'll be a rollover uh, mm. type thing. So, I think you know all of that uh, pending uh, uh, the politics, frankly, a bit. Mm. Gavin, your your take on the the, the spending review against the, the portrait that you've laid out here. So again, the, the spending review, I would refer everybody to chapter three on government finances. Um, this is obviously one of the big things which is which is setting up the rest of the year, and I think. One of the points that we draw out in the report is that we've heard lots of rhetoric about this being the end of austerity. In fact, given the money that's already been pledged to the NHS, if we look at the difference between health spending and other departmental spending, when you take that increase in health spending into account, any increase across other departments almost disappears. And the numbers that we use don't include things like defence and international aid, which are also ring-fenced in some way, or the sort of devolved consequences of increasing health spending. So for all of this discussion that you know, austerity might be coming to an end, actually for most departments, they're still going to see their budgets squeezed over the next few years. Uh, and that's what a review has to, ha has to, has to cope with. What, what about um, the question of how prepared we are for Brexit or not. One of the things the Institute gets asked most often, and I'm sure you do too. Um, what, what, how, how, do you, how do you give an answer to that, and particularly the question of preparedness for no deal? Well, I've never shied away from the fact that this is a, uh, a complicated problem. Uh, and I've never uh, pretended that, uh, you know, it's all going to go swimmingly well in the event of a no deal, which is just a few days away, um, or potentially. Uh, uh, so, I, but on the other hand, the civil service has been focused for, for quite some time on the mitigations of the worst consequences of a no deal uh, outcome. Mm -hmm. And I believe we have, uh, you know, we've focused resources, we've moved resources, we have uh, been putting in place those mitigations such that the worst consequences will be mitigated, in my view. Um, uh, it, you know, I've sort of consistently said um, uh, it, it, it is obviously difficult. Uh, do we prepare for one set of outcomes in a no deal or do we prepare for a different set of outcomes with a longer tip time for implementation in a, in a, in a deal? Um, uh, you know, and and uh, in, the, in the latter, uh, in the second half of last year, we really did put the beam um, uh, uh, into the no deal preparations and I believe we are significantly therefore better uh, uh, prepared than we have been. Um, uh, do, do I, you know, will, will, w will things not, uh, be a bit bumpy? Of course they will, in the event that that is the outcome. Um, uh, and I hope that it isn't the outcome, um, but uh, in the end, uh, you know, it, it, w the civil service has to be ready for that. And one of the most, one of the difficult things is, is you know, orienting large groups of people uh, in, in preparation 
uh, for something which actually um, is not government policy. Government policy is going to do it. Um, so uh, that's that's what we've been doing. So you know, and that's been my answer consistently, frankly. And the longer it goes on, the better we are prepared. But we still won't be completely prepared. Yes, and as you say, it's not just Brexit, but multiple versions of Brexit. I mean, it's, it's running it's several part of the complexity. Se several projects at, at once. Um, Gavin, on the, on the question of um, <coughs> ministerial turnover that this is, has brought about, what, what are the kind of strains that your team has picked up about, about what this, this does to departments and so on? Um, as some of you will know, we've got a long-standing archive called Ministers <coughs> Reflect, uh, where we speak to lots of former ministers and they talk about their mm. experience. And you get from them the sense that they've been at their sort of department or in their particular post for two years and all of a sudden there's a reshuffle, the call comes and they have to go and relearn everything, a totally new policy area, a totally new department all over again. And there are some areas where we've seen a sort of particular, um, particularly high levels of churn. I mean, we've been through a number of housing ministers since 2010, probably more than any other sort of significant post. And I think that also outlines that it's not just the direction that Secretaries of State um, concept that's important. This is also junior ministers who tend to do a lot of the hard work around implementation, getting policies delivered, getting things through Parliament. Um, and again, I think you know, prisons is one area where we've seen a little bit of turnover in the junior minister, a significant amount of turnover in the Secretary of State since 2010, and that's an area where we've seen prison violence going up. That's starting. We, well, we'll see if that gets reversed in the next sort of set of uh, set of figures. But yeah, incredibly disruptive to the civil servants um, as well as to ministers themselves. And not that we want Whitehall Monitor to become any, any longer, um, but uh, we, we do use it as a way to call for government data we would like to be uh, more easily accessible. If I, if I asked you your wish list, which in fact I managed to get you to publish at one point last year, uh, your wish list for government data, that, uh, but both for government's sake, I should say, to be able to manage, more, uh, manage uh, departments better, but also for the public's sake to be able to whole government to account. What, what would be top of your wish, wish list? Um, so as, as you said, Ron, we do have a gaps in government data paper uh, on our website from last September. I think some of the key things, um, when it comes to the civil service, I know that the civil service is working on this. We have lots of diversity measures, but not socioeconomic background diversity. That's a really important thing that we need to see published um, as pledged by the diversity and inclusion plan in the next few years. We'd also like to see a list of all the data sets that departments are actually responsible for because I don't think we quite have the sense we need of what's there and the potential of what we could all do with there. So often, just starting, that, starting at that starting point, if that's not a complete tautology, um, to understand what it is we've got and what we can tell from that I think is, is very important. A lot of this is also around improving the quality of data that's sort of there already. So we did um, a big report at the end of last year about the quality of contracting data, um, procurement data, and it's still quite difficult to use. Some of it isn't published. That that is published isn't in a format that's particularly useful to everybody. So there are definitely some gaps that publishing a list of all data sets would help us to identify. We already know some of those gaps that we'd like to see filled. And we'd like to see the sort of data published in a quality which makes it much easier for everybody across government, everybody outside of government, to put together those data sets and really sort of mm. unlock the insights that are contained within mm. them. Thanks for that. John, let me ask you just about a few of these and then I'm going to come to questions. But um, one would be, oh, Gavin touched on the outsourcing, the contracting data. You know, you know, the government's trying to make a case, in many cases, that uh, contracting works very well. Almost impossible to get uh, data that show whether or not a contract is is performing well. That'd be one example. Uh, two, if you if you talk to the people in uh, in, in Parliament who have to scrutinise uh, government accounts, departmental accounts every time they come out, they say, look, it, it's completely inconsistent year from year. New minister comes along, badges something as the green economy or something. You can't match it up with the year before. It's just not consistent. And, and then, you know, the third one, this, this is apparently arcane subject of, of single departmental plans, but something the Institute is very invested in and in saying, look, we, we really um, approve of government setting out to look at the, the, the performance of, uh, of departments and um, to measure year on year and how that's going. Well, how about publishing these things? Well, let me make a couple of comments on this. The first is um, a, a, a data generally. And I uh, um, completely agree that we need to step up our efforts across government. Um, uh, the data is held in all sorts of different ways. Uh, 
you know, the same person will be held in different departmental databases with slightly different things and they don't talk to each other and sometimes they're legislatively blocked and sometimes they're just blocked and sometimes they're just different <coughs> systems. So, I mean, there's any number of problems that... Uh, uh, as soon as you go into the data space that, that exist across government data. That, I think we, and, and despite our, I think, very good progress on digital transformations and such things, uh, which I think has been, we should be very proud of and we are continuing to drive, it is now bumping into the issues associated with data because the next piece is AI and all of the things that we could do there, which I think are of the future. So I do accept that we have to take a step now, uh, it, soon, and, and, and I'm trying to reflect how to do that best across a complex system to really try to rationalise and get on top of the government data. Um, uh, and as you know, you know, we've got the Digital Economy Act, which gives us access to sharing some things which are otherwise not is not otherwise not legal. So there's lots of levers we can do to, I think, improve genera, uh, 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 data generally. On your issue on contracting, um, uh, I, I agree with you. Uh, uh, you know, we have we have been um, uh, post Carillion about a year ago, uh, doing quite a lot of work, which is now coming to I think a conclusion about how do we, you know, how do we fundamentally um, uh, address the interface between the public and the private sector in all sorts of ways. One of which is a much clearer and agreed set of KPIs, for instance, around each contract. Mm -hmm. Now, that is n not straightforward, and of course we start from a very low base, so that's going to take some time, but we have a very, very clear intent that that is something that we must do and must get better, and you'll hear more about that, I think, as we, as we uh, go forward. And then on the SDPs particularly, as you know, I have championed, in fact, introduced those and have championed them ever since. And, you know, at one level, this is really about joining the inputs to the outputs. It sort of started that basic, which weren't necessarily joined up. Bring those together, that is uh, job one. This is nothing other than a business plan. Um, and any, ask any company, and there are always uh, sensitivities around a business plan, because they may have all sorts of commercially sensitive things or things sensitive to the population, you know, to mm. work for, all of those things. So I think the truth is the SDPs are improving year by year. They are increasingly important for us um, because as the outputs get tougher to deliver with the given inputs, then the join up of those things and the prioritization of those things become really important. What we're doing this year is for the very first time, and I think much uh, more strongly than previous years, we're joining up the SDP process with the spending round process, mm. which actually I think will reinforce both. So I'm, I'm very encouraged by this. I recognise the continuous call for more publicity, more publicity. I think those are getting better too, the things that we put out. I was saying to you the other night, we were having this conversation in a different context, if you look at all the SDPs across the departments, it's about that thick. Um, I'm not sure you'd do with them when you looked at them, uh, uh, and therefore just sort of spewing it out in an unformatted basis I think is unhelpful. I do think, though, last year's were, where, where we formatted them the same, Every, you know, there were objectives, there were performance measures. So we're beginning, I think, to get better. And I think the, the pressure is welcomed to keep going. Mm. Um, uh, uh, and I think that is a direction of travel that we must mm. respond to. Mm. I'm smiling slightly because I don't think the answer that these are too big for the world to understand or uh, not polished enough is going to sit easily as a final answer. No, but I it. might not choose to articulate all of the detail of mm. the things that go mm. on inside a government department mm. for the, uh, because, you know, uh, there might be all sorts of plans, the workforce plans which, which may yeah. not be formulated properly, yeah. all of those sorts of sensitivities we've got to be mindful of, I think. Well, to be continued because it's not just us, it's the uh, parliamentary committees as well. Let's have some questions. Uh, uh, let's go here on the aisle. Um, and then I, I'm going to take them in twos. Go ahead. Um, Oliver Wright from the Times. Uh, given the current parliamentary deadlock, um, it looks increasingly unlikely that the remaining pieces of Brexit primary legislation needed for a no deal will be published in time for, uh, be passed in time for March. How problematic is that for the civil service? Uh, and what does it mean for no deal preparations? Thank you. And behind you. Hi there, Duncan Robinson from The Economist. Um, it's a question on the government's rather thin domestic agenda. 
How much is that down to a lack of capacity in civil service and how much is that down to a lack of political capital, fundamentally, not having the votes to push through anything mildly controversial? John, no time and no policies. Um, I'm not going to get into the politics here because I, I, I'm absolutely not going to do that and because um, I think that's just too complicated at the moment. Uh, of course, it would be... Um, uh, you know, we have, we have prioritised the primary legislation and indeed the secondary uh, instruments to, to, for, for a no deal. Um, and there are mitigating um, acts in the event that we can't get them through. And, and it's all a bit of an unknown because you don't quite know how a piece of primary legislation is going to go through the House or both Houses anyway, even after it's introduced. So there's been an awful lot of work, is what I would say, to make sure that the most important ones get done. Uh, the current uh, situation is, of course, make, makes things a little bit more uncertain. You, you know, I, we'll do our best, uh, and the more we can get through, the better, is how I would answer your question. Um, on uh, the domestic agenda, I mean, I think it is true. Uh, you know, I mean, it is a reality, of course, uh, 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 that um, uh, committee bandwidth, uh, leadership bandwidth, parliamentary bandwidth is all taken up. Just you know. Uh, is taken up with the issue of the day, and that is the reality. There's no point shying away from that. But on the other hand, um, uh, you know, just the other day we launched the, the, the National Health Service long-term plan. That is a substantial piece of domestic agenda. Um, uh, I don't know whether you've read it, but it is a it is a significantly ambitious, significantly far-reaching uh, piece of work. So where I believe um, uh, you know the, the 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 most important things are getting progressed on the domestic agenda. Some things, of course, are being uh, displaced, and 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 that is. Um, unfortunate, frankly, in my view, but, uh, but it is the reality. Uh, but I do think that the government is still progressing the most important, and I give you the long-term plan as a, as a great example. Substantial piece of work, actually. I mean, it's huge. Thanks for that. Uh, over here, and then uh, over by the fireplace. Uh, could, could you wait for the um, microphone, please? Yep, coming around the other way. A question for, uh, can you hear me? Yes, a uh, question for John. Um, Lisa O'Carroll from The Guardian. Uh, two questions. One, um, how do you rate the chances of those pieces of legislation that the government said should get through by Brexit actually getting through in the event of no deal? And two, can you just give us some details, numbers of the 400,000 or whatever figure you like to pick, um, thousand civil servants, how many have been deployed uh, to the Brexit department or deployed into a different department because of Brexit? Do you have, can we have a handle on that? Um, uh, I'm sorry, should we take a second yeah. one at the same time? Yeah. Thanks. Uh, Julian McRae, King's College London, Associate of the IFG. Um, Gavin, brilliant. Love the charts, as ever. Um, I was just wondering, just on the capability of the civil service, there's been huge amounts of initiatives to improve it. Are there things we can tell from the data about whether those initiatives are working to improve the capability the civil service has? And then related to that, John, we've talked before about the functions having to beg, borrow and steal budgets to drive some of these capability building things. How confident are we that spend, the next spending review is actually going to be of dedicated budgets to those functions um, so they can actually set out the timelines for improving capability that you really need? Great. John, why don't you go first? Okay. Um, let me try and do the numbery ones. I, um, what I can tell you is that, and I said this to one of the subcommittee or other the other day, um, you know, we have we have we've hired 10,000. We've got 5,000 in the pipeline. There's, uh, so there's 15,000 new people. Um, I can't remember how big the Dexu department is, but it, uh, that that was largely staffed in the first instance. You probably know. I think about 600. Yeah, six to six to 800. That was largely staffed by people moving in the early days. So that was a sort of transfer game. Since then, we've hired the numbers that I've talked about. Um, uh, and um, depending upon the scenario, uh, uh, of course, if we are in a a rather more, I don't know, I don't know who you were sending that to, but anyway, uh, uh, if we find ourselves in a sort of, um, a, you know, a, a, a sort of crash out, no deal, then we then we have to put some operational capability into place, which is uh, a few thousand people in an operational sense. And that is largely because there will be a period of time when the system will be working sort of 24-7 and, 
uh, in, a, in a rather more um, uh, command and control mode. So that, if you like, is, is, the, is the next focus. But um, uh, we are largely ready with that. Um, uh, uh, and indeed, you know, a part of the preparations as we get closer is, the, is, is that last act of, of getting those people ready to move. And that will be a, a literally, that will, be a, that will be a transference of existing staff off something that they're doing into uh, a, a rather more operational mode. That's... The last piece. It, I, it's, it's, it'll be it, a bit less, I think. I can't, I mean, I don't... Says so see to the press, don't quote me, but I, 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 you know, it's not an accurate number because I don't have it completely in my head. I'm just trying to remember what the roughly, roughly number is. I think it's a bit less than 5,000. Um, I'm just going to pick and choose. I, I mean, the, 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 the spending round and the, uh, you know, as you know, I have been passionate about building professional capability into the system. Uh, one of the interesting things about Brexit, of course, is large amounts of the demand is exactly that professional capability because actually, as I said, this is about doing and delivering, not just thinking. So large amounts of the budget uh, that has been allocated to Brexit, which is several billion, um, ha has gone to bringing in, whether it's technical specialists to build the new IT systems or whether it's project management capability and PMO capability. So, so that has been an accelerator to this. And, and, and as you say, uh, Julian, we are uh, uh, orchestrating for the next spending round uh, the sort of strategic funding of certain aspects of the central functions uh, because I think that is important in the long run. So I'm hopeful that that will be the case. Great, Gavin, your, your thoughts? Um, so on, on Julian's sort of yes. question about data and capability, I think one of the things that I have the luxury of saying, having put, helped put together a huge data-driven report, is we don't necessarily have all the data that we'd like to be able to answer that question fully. And I think one of the things that we'd like to see, um, and I think um, John has previously sort of talked about this as well, is that one way of doing that would be to see in the single departmental plans the sort of particular skills, the particular functions, particular professions that are represented in departments against um, some of those um, objectives, um, which would allow us to measure it um, in a slightly more constructive way, I think. There are clearly bits and pieces across government that we can say. I mean, the Infrastructure and Projects Authority and Project Delivery, there's some numbers there that we can talk about. Similarly, sort of growth, we can take as proxies, I suppose, for some things, growth of things like academies in particular functions. Um, and again, just on that sort of functional point, and we, we sort of talk about this in the report as well, we'd still like to see more progress on representation of some of those functions at the top, so on the Civil Service Board, um, for instance, because it's when you've got that leadership at the top that you're really able to get the numbers that we need. I preface what I'm about to say with a huge thanks to everybody who's given us lots of support on the data. It's still quite difficult to find some of those numbers on uh, the sort of functions and professions side. Thanks very much. Let me just squeeze in a couple. John, John I know, has to get back. Uh, we've got one here, one right at the back, and one at the front. Let me take those three together. Thank you. I'm Ben Glaze from the Daily Mirror. Um, John, you said earlier in relation to no-deal preparations that the longer it goes on, the better we are prepared, but we still won't be completely prepared. How long would you need to be completely prepared? <laughs> Question. Right, at the front. Uh, hi, John, Susanna from Civil Service World. You've just been speaking about functions and you spoke at the beginning about cross-cutting work. I think last time you were here, you said you, under you the changes, the development of functions and cross-cutting work will need to change the accountability wiring of the Civil Service as well. What's your current thinking on what that might look like? Um, and Gavin, this isn't for you to answer now, but it would be interesting to see future Whitehall monitors ref trying to record in some way who is working on cross-cutting work, what are the cross-cutting budgets, how is there data that shows us progress of that kind of agenda, as well as obviously the professions and functions data. Thanks very much. And there, there was another one. Yes, yeah, sorry, right at the... Great. Uh, Rob Whiteman from SIPFA. Can I ask you a post-Brexit question? Um, it, it's possible that people in Sunderland will feel as remote from Westminster as they do from Brussels. And um, after we leave the EU, my taxi driver might still feel as detached from the elite as, uh, as while we're in the EU. Can I, can I ask, are we measuring the right things? There's a, a lot of discussion around the world about 
whether we need to judge ourselves uh, um, and judge our performance by uh, whether, whether people feel that policy is going in the right direction. And also, John, you know, is there a case for devolution or decentralisation away from Westminster because Brexit might not solve the problem of, of disillusionment? Sorry. Thank you very much. Three very interesting questions. How long to be perfectly prepared, whatever that might mean, uh, functions again, and um, the thrust of this on devolution away from Westminster and the detachment of the population. John, do you want to go? Can I go I, backwards? I, yes, and then um, I'll come back I, again. I think you're absolutely right. I think we are, um, uh, you know, we're all sitting in here in Westminster. Um, uh, uh, and, and there is no question. I mean, this, this government, I think, has got a very good policy, which is, which is to, you know, is to, is to understand the full nature of the country much, much better. We are pushing quite one of the things, one of the strategies, I haven't talked about it much, one of the strategies in our estates strategy is to actually move, um, uh, you know, have a civil service which is much more distributed across the country um, uh, and indeed into the devolved nations. So, uh, you know, and that's quite a complicated thing because, of course, you're talking about young people are moving, you know, but, but actually you've got to make it a strategic intent. Could we create a transport hub in Birmingham? Could we create a culture hub in Manchester? Could we create a health or a technical hub in Leeds? Uh, could we do some stuff around our enormous Bristol base? You know, so um, uh, we're doing a lot um, um, and, and it's the combination of departmental strategic moves and estates strategy which by the way is impossible to do unless you have cross-cutting functions across so that you can bring together uh, multiple departments in a single uh, building and, and we're doing that as well as you know already the uh, those by HMRC have moved, will, will move 35,000 civil servants around in the country uh, as we start to aggregate into better more central, you know, more, not central, but more, more larger offices. So I think that is absolutely the push, and I, and I, and we are, uh, but, but by the way, you know, again, it's a long-term push to make it sustainable, uh, but it's a very, very important thing. And indeed, that goes to policy making as well, because we've got to understand everybody's perspective, and it's not, you know, I think some of the evidence says that we could do better. Um, uh, how long will it take? I'm going to steal John Thompson. Uh, no, you know, I mean, from the moment we decide exactly what border we want, it will take several years to put it in place. Um, uh, the issue isn't the putting it in place. Several. The issue, several. Several. Yeah. several. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, 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 and, it, uh, and therefore, the important thing is to decide, is it friction less? Is it minimum friction? Is it, what kind of, you know, what, what kind of thing? So, so that's a great example of where you know, we might wish it were otherwise, but the truth is it will take time because we have to build the systems and we have to put the infrastructure in place and all those things. Now, we have those plans um, uh, and we can certainly make some progress on the front ends of those things, but the truth is it will take time uh, uh, to do that. And that might be the most extreme, uh, but everything from here, you know, tomorrow to there and everything in between, um, uh, I think. And on the... Um, Accountability, and I can pick this with, uh, join this with, with the with the comment about governance. Um, uh, I have, from you know, 30 years running large complex organisations, I'm a big believer in clarity of accountability, uh, and clarity of accountability usually goes downwards, um, and what we have to rely on, um, uh, and and in fact, underneath the imposition of functions across our system, is a system of standards. <laughs> So you don't have to change the accountability. You just have to do, you're accountable to do something in line with a set of standards, which we define across the civil service, for instance. Actually, the way we do commercial contract is like this. So you're accountable for your commercial contract, but by the way, here's the standard for how you should do it at a minimum. So the setting of minimum standards goes with the functional structure, and that begins to get around this notion of saying, well, who's accountable? The answer is, you're accountable, I've just set the standards to which you will be accountable. And that is true across multiple dimensions, mm. uh, whether it's the technical way that you do a technical build, whether it's how you control, uh, uh, how you pay your people, how you career develop your people, whether how you do your contracts, all of those things can be set. And one of the evolutions 
uh, that, in fact, Mark and I are discussing uh, is how do we now reflect in the governance structures of the civil service itself the fact that we have now a matrix structure across the civil service. We've, we haven't actually changed the governance of the civil service to reflect that matrix structure to the point about putting function leads onto a, a, an accountable board um, uh, where the line and the functions come together. And that's one of the conversations that we've got to have and I think we'll be in the next phase of the evolution of this. So I think I'm hopeful that we can move that forward. And the matrix being up to the permanent secretary and to the, uh, within the function. Yes, the matrix being a vertical line of of the the department and a functional axis across the department. For those who don't live and and breathe all this, as as we do. Gavin, your last word. Um, Susanna, let's talk. Um, (laughs) Rob, if we had more time, I'd ask you what you thought we should be measuring. But I think it's a really big question that comes back to the priorities of government, what it is trying to achieve and what its vision for the country is. Which brings us to something that we, we have in this year's report, which is the sort of difficulties of measuring performance, because a lot of the outputs of government are quite difficult to quantify. Um, but also to what extent can we use what the people think as a proxy? Because trust in government, um, and in fact in politicians it's quite low, it will not surprise you. In civil servants it's higher and rising. It, those are sometimes only proxies for getting at some of these sort of deeper issues. Um, but again, I'd be very interested to talk further about what else we should be looking at. With that, we're going to have to wrap up. I'm sorry for the hands that were still still there. Gavin, thank you tremendously, and the terrific team of eight other people from the IFG who helped put this together this year. Um, terrific, thanks, and uh, well done for that. John Manzoni, thank you for joining us at 12 minutes' notice. Could I just Always say thank you yeah. for the report as yeah. well, because I think it's, uh, it's absolutely fabulous to have IFG as a sort of critical friend, and I think this is a really useful and, uh, and helpful report, so thank you. Thank you very much indeed.